Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Today we feature part two of my interview with Elaine Brown, former chairman of the Black Panther Party, a musical artist who had two wonderful records, one with Motown called Elaine Brown and the other called Seize the Time. She is a very, very vibrant activist and author. Her book, A Taste of Power, and her work in Oakland today, creating housing for the underserved and opportunity is extraordinary. I hope you enjoy our second conversation. Thank you. I remember the energy in some of your music that, how do I say, captured that vitality. And I remember it being controversial at the time. And what, what fascinated me, this is just, just an aside about some of your music, was you, you had a very sophisticated technical sense in your music and then a very fierce sound and lyrics, lyrical presence. And it, it almost was like, I think of the old uh, Trojan horse, like your music had this soothing way of diffusing in and then opening onto the challenge much more, much more powerfully, much more directly. And uh, I'm curious whether you think the arts can penetrate things now when uh, like a song like The End of Silence, yes, it's time you know who you really are and not try to whitewash the truth. You're a man you see and a man must be whatever he'll be or he won't be free. That sounds like you were singing that to that person who was trying to please. And I, 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 I found in many of your songs, which you might call it the chorus at the resolution, was an intensity. And as you mentioned, Che Guevara, having to take action. But like you said, it's only a song and action is, is supreme. Well, but do the arts play a role? Do they help us? Do they help us mount our courage and stop being deferential? Um, um, I would say no. Um, okay. Okay. I would say that, um, but they may inspire someone to think about something. I mean, you know, there was a person that I knew or met that was writing a book about the influence of uh, it could have been Bob Dylan's music. Um, and we all liked Bob Dylan at the time. I certainly did. Mm -hmm. And I still like Bob Dylan's music from that era. Um, yeah. um, but Bob Dylan's movie didn't, music didn't move a thing. Now, did, did people sing uh, Blowing in the Wind? Um, sure, they did in large numbers, just like they sing Beyonce songs or some other stuff. They, they, you've got more millions of people now listening to uh, the entertainers of the world. Uh, but Bob Dylan was uh, had a lot of uh, messages in his songs. They, uh, but are they going to be an instrument for change? Um, not so sure. I don't see any evidence of it. As that's what I told this woman, and she was telling me as a songwriter um, that you know <laughs> she uh, uh, she was annoyed that I couldn't see the value in songs, you know, or poetry, you got 80 million black people out here that think they're rappers. And some of them in the beginning of rap, as it, as we've now come to call it rap, but we used to have, you know, rap kind of stuff, you know, oral traditions that go back to the uh, slave era. And this is coming out of that, but going, uh, going, using rap, rap Brown was called rap Brown because he could rap. He was very good at, you know, being street rapping, you know, rhyming and all of that. That was pretty common in the black community, especially in the urban areas. And so as it evolved uh, in the beginning, you had uh, NWA and you had uh, Ice-T. Ice-T had a song out, a piece out called Cop Killer. And uh, Dan mm -hmm. Quayle said, if we hear this song, told Sony or whoever it was, that we better not hear that song again because he was advocating killing police. This was ice -T. Tea, iced tea, right, right, and um, and so, 
Sony told him they reissued the CD and told him he better not sing it at a concert or his contract was being kept. Now Ice-T came to play the police on TV. So that's how relevant his uh, message was <laughs> to Dan Quill personally was offended by it and a bunch of other people like John Wayne, I think Wade or somebody like that. It was amazing. It only took one or two uh, prominent white people to shut that music down. Okay. Now, uh, you know, I, I love writing songs and I love singing songs. I like playing songs on my piano. Uh, and so all of that is a personal pleasure that I find even inside of uh, all of the chaos and war that we have been going through for all of my life. Um, and so um, it has brought me a certain amount of comfort. Uh, I can express the thoughts that are going through my head uh, as to what I see, uh, because that's what art is. It's, you know, all of it is. It's a reflection of what somebody else, what is going on on the ground. It isn't the action. It's a reflection, a report, a so forth of the action that somebody take. You don't have a painting of nothing, although you do have abstract paintings, um, but uh, people make paintings of stuff, people and events or whatever. Take a photograph of something that is real. Otherwise, what is the photograph? <laughs> so the action is the driver. Uh, why are we moved by the George Floyd thing? Because we actually had to witness the murder of a human being and for nine minutes and people became glued. I couldn't look at it because I didn't see the point. It was just, uh, it, it reached the point of being, you know, uh, voyeuristic and crazy to sit there and want to see. And he called for his mother and all that. Those are the things that have moved a lot of people though. Um, but they, it wasn't a song and it wasn't the video. It was what happened and they saw what happened. It's the same thing with during the era of Dr. King, um, you know, up until World War II, Nobody in America had a TV to look at to talk about. It. I was like, what was on TV today? Uh, once uh, there was mass production of things like televisions and refrigerators and what have you, which I don't want to get into how that all happened. But anyway, once there was this mass production of things like television and the world, uh, as we used to say, the world is watching. People saw that black people were being beaten up for trying to go to a restroom or a restaurant. They saw dogs being put on people who tried to vote. They didn't know, they didn't know that this had been, been going on. See, so that's what's happening today. This stuff, black people, it's like coronavirus, what's new? I've been suffering from the highest rate of prostate cancer death since there's been an identification of prostate cancer. I have the highest rate of breast cancer death. I have the highest infant mortality rate. I have the highest maternal mortality rate. This is in terms of just health care, I'm speaking of, okay? That's not counting asthma rates and all the other things that I could say that Black people live at the bottom of life in America. So coronavirus is like, oh, are Black people dying in greater percentages than everybody else? What a surprise. It's only a surprise to white people. It's not a surprise to Black people. We've been living like this all of our lives. Yes. Some of us have been fighting to try to expose it and reveal it. And, uh, and that, you know, that, and that's what's happened. But as far as music, I mean, I've written about, you know, I've, since I've been uh, in the coronavirus lockdown, um, I've written, you know, probably 10 songs reflecting my own uh, uh, feelings about some of these things in terms of, you know, why aren't we fighting? That's my basic message. Uh, why are we crying and why are we fi why aren't we fighting? Uh, but um, so I don't think that anything I could sing, even if I were Beyonce or my good friend Alicia Keys, who I think has wonderful music. I, I absolutely adore her. Uh, she does have a little more meaning in some of her music um, than a lot of others. But and people can sing. They you you can go to a concert with people like Alicia Keys and what have you, and these people can sing every single word and nuance that she's ever written. I saw some people uh, in a during this uh, all these various things about the the spirit of coronavirus and the first responders. I really detest that term. Uh, some hospital workers were looking at John Legend uh, over there. Um, over there, like a TV, you know, connection just to that hospital and the people that work in intensive care and what have you. And this was like their little 
entertainment or something. I don't know what John Legend role thought it would, he would be. And he came on and on this big screen TV and he started singing his song, All of Me. Um, I couldn't tell you three word, three sentences in that song, but everybody there was softly singing. It was quite beautiful. And they, and they had a and they had a little break from watching people die all day long, uh, while they all sang all of me. So what was the value of that? Well, I think it was inspiring and giving them a moment to reflect and think about love and think about something else. But did it matter in terms of the people that were dropping dead on that floor in that Brooklyn mm-hmm. hospital? I don't think so. Yeah, the uh, I know uh, Wesley Morris, a black writer for the New York Times. Recently had an article about Patti LaBelle's live version of Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes song, If You Don't Know Me By Now. Right. About people that found solace and uh, emotional power in that. I once. Well, just uh, a minute. Yeah. We have to stop. You can't just throw that out there and not let me comment because I have a little bit. First, <laughs> all right. of all, first of all, I saw that person attempting to make some sense out of If You Don't Know Me By Now. The singer was really mm-hmm. a Teddy Pendergrass. Uh, the song mm-hmm. was put out by That's the right. group and called uh, "If You Don't Know Me" by uh, by uh, the group uh, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, uh, right. which is a Philadelphia group, and which Patti Labelle is from Philadelphia and never lifted her finger that I know of to do anything about the oppression of black people. So let's not get it twisted. Not her, not Harold mm-hmm. Melvin, and not Teddy Pendergrass. Although he put one song out called the more interesting song, what? Uh, uh, Wake Up Everybody was a song that he did that she could have sung that might have been more direct. If you don't know me by now, of course, you can flip any song into meaning anything. But um, I don't even I didn't even understand the connection between a romantic mm-hmm. song that a guy is singing to his woman because she thinks he's cheating and the moment. There was a song yeah. that Teddy Pendergrass put out that was very popular called Wake Up Everybody. It was a song like that. Marvin Gaye had a, what's going on? These songs yeah. have been great, but have they moved anybody to do anything? Have these people used their voices, these powerful uh, uh, recording stars, rappers, basketball players, have they used their, 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 uh, their platforms, their incredible platforms to do anything? No. Colin Kaepernick did a minor thing, took a knee, and the whole world went crazy. And that and the only reason he did that is because he was sitting on the bench during the uh, national anthem, something I've done all my life. Um, and his uh, one of the coaches said, you can't just sit on the bench. And he said, well, then I'm going to do something that looks respectful. I'll take a knee like a prayer, but I won't stand for it. Now, that was all that Colin Kaepernick did. Hmm. Hmm. That's all he did, and everybody went damn crazy. It ain't like he went out there with guns blazing and said, okay, I'm gonna, if you killed uh, Trayvon Martin or whoever it was that he was upset about, one particular case like a, like this case of George Floyd, all right, now I'm going out here and find this cop and blow him away. It's not like he did something like that or encouraged that or anything else. He just silently, that was less than Martin Luther King did in the, in the little marches, and that became a big drama. I haven't even seen Patti LaBelle do that. Yeah. So you can't quote Patti LaBelle, not you, to me as though that's yeah. slick stuff that happened. And isn't that great that she reissued that? No, it's nothing. It is a distraction to keep people from thinking about where are we now? So you can, I saw a little girls, there was a moment when they little girls walking around and, and with a placard that says, we're not our ancestors excuse the language, we'll fuck you up. Really? You really think, you know, I know 10 cops in Oakland that I can walk down the street and will beat you half to death for carrying that sign. That's how Mm -hmm. stupid it is. Not to count how disrespectful it is of a 400-year history of resistance. That's just disrespectful. Mm -hmm. So these kinds of words and slogans, Black Lives Matter, if you don't know me right now, you know what? You think that, I mean, not you. What, you, you think that's slick? That's hip? That's, isn't that cool? What? Are we really dealing with this in a serious way? Well, I've seen people here in Oakland on a caravan of cars, blowing their horns, reaching out of their cars, windows, and rooftops 
with placards that say Black Lives Matter and Justice for George and whatever other little slogans they've got, driving by homeless camp encampments in their cars. See any contradiction in that? Singing songs, doing the electric slide in front of the Oakland City Hall. Um, no, I don't think that this cultural question, but there could be a place where instead of doing a Twitter, uh, Instagram message, these people could be doing something with their tremendous global platforms to really be inspiring, but their music is not it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I spent some years in my life, uh, making blues records and, uh, Really, what I was looking for was Mississippi, Alabama, deep blues. And there there was one artist who he's no longer alive named Willie King. And he had a song that reminded me of some of the ways you've painted the picture today. It was called Terrorized. And it started out, you talking about terror. You talking about terror. People, I've been terrorized all my days. They hung me from the tallest oak tree. They changed my name. They left me in chains. Willie wrote that song on the night of 9-11. He was watching all of the TV, and he wrote that song. He made a demo of it, and he called me, and he said, can I, can I make a blues album that is about love? And I said, well, I imagine so, but why, why are you asking? And he said, he saw this uh, response to 9-11 and everybody's concern and everybody's uprising. He said, how come they never think about black people like they think about those people? And then the next day he said he wanted to put that song out, but he wanted to embed it in an album about love because he knew those people that were killed in 9-11 were not perpetrators in, in uh, of the feelings he had. Society was the perpetrator. And so he wanted to address that in the, in the record. But I, I remember very, those very strong feelings he had about what you might say, all these structural things, all these systematic things, all these inhuman things that uh, I remember Bob Dylan wrote in, uh, one of his earlier songs, Masters of War. Let me ask you one question. Is your money that good? Will it buy you forgiveness? Do you think it could? I think you will find when your death takes its toll, all the money you made will never buy back your soul. This, this predation upon humanity, particularly enormously on black people, is a hideous inhumanity. And I don't know if the music can help us get over it, but I think people like you looking it in the eye are helping people, what you might call, come to the awareness. And I guess I, I want to ask you, you told me that you've been building in Oakland. You've been uh, putting together as the CEO of Oakland and World Enterprises something to help formerly incarcerated people, something to help the open community, something to help with housing. What, what inspired you to do that? And how can people, how can people join in helping you? Well, you know, it wasn't an inspiration. I mean, it's pretty obvious that housing is a problem. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. That, that doesn't require too much thought really. Um, but um, in particular, the focus mission of Oakland and the world is simply to create uh, businesses for ownership by formerly incarcerated and what I call other extremely socioeconomically marginalized people, meaning poor black people mostly. Now, the point though is in the absence of a real movement, in the absence of a movement, despite what my friend Angela Davis likes to say that the reason that people like me don't see a movement because it's being led by queer women of color. I like to know where that is. But anyhow, the question is, um, what can you do when you've arrived at my age and there are these same issues facing us, but I have the tools, uh, at least the history 
uh, to begin, begin to think about ways we could create what we called back in the day a survival program, meaning in order for you to begin to even fight or think about fighting, you cannot be hungry. That is why we fed people. We fed them for several reasons. One, because they needed the food, but we certainly couldn't handle the kind of volume of people, of food that people would need across the country. We were the Black Panther Party. We weren't the government. So we, the breakfast program had several, uh, several purposes. One was to feed the people that got fed. Another was to organize people around their human right to have food and that money should not stop them from being able to eat or the lack of money, which gets them into capitalism. But we can't, you know, we're not going to go there yet. We're just going to talk about breakfast and then we might talk about lunch and then we might talk about dinner, we might talk about housing, we might talk about health care and so forth. And bit by bit, as Lenin suggested, the people will begin to make demands on the government that the government can accommodate, but there'll be that one demand that it won't. And that's when the people will be ready for revolution. That's the short mm -hmm. overview. Mm -hmm. So that's our goal. So when I looked out, um, there were so many things. And I do think, uh, you know, music can get people thinking just like speeches. Otherwise, I wouldn't do this stuff. Now, mm -hmm. as one person, a, a guy who's here in the city of Oakland, uh, who is a county a supervisor, which is the administrative body that runs the county, everything, health care, public health, uh, the sheriff's department, everything else that's here, um, really is just an administrative body, but it is elected. And there are only five of them in this county. And this is, you know, one of the top big counties in the state of California, which is the, you know, has the largest economy, all the other stuff you know about what California is. And so this guy asked me, what did I think we could do, we could do about recidivism? So that's how stuff gets parsed out. You know, you start saying, what should we do about the prison industrial complex? You know, as though there's some answer. Just a minute. Let me let me come up and tell you what it is. What can we do about recidivism? Well, as I said, in order for you to have a solution, you at least have to know what, have a correct analysis of the problem. Now, what is the reason that people keep going back to prison who've been to prison? Well, it's not really complicated. Usually it's poverty. I don't have anything. And then when I come out of prison, I have even, I, that's why I went to prison. I robbed somebody, 90%. Everybody's not a child molester. Everybody's not an arsonist. Everybody's not a, a, a mass murderer. Matter of fact, you can't find any blacks that you can identify. So what is it that people generally go to prison for? Or maybe they go to prison because they, you know, beat up somebody who was the lover. There's a love question. But the murder rate, which is really not that high, it's like 9% of the total number of so-called crimes. You have a lot of people that we know in there on, at this time, uh, drug-related charges are just doing a lot, long time uh, because of the Clinton Three Strikes Bill and certainly the one that Pete Wilson followed up with in California. So you have a situation where I went to prison because I tried to rob somebody and as I'd like to tell all of my uh, brothers and sisters, especially the brothers, uh, I can't believe you went to prison for like $100, $200 or $1,000 or whatever it was. You need to go to the Wells Fargo School of how to rob and not go to prison. That's the school you need to be in because you're not good at it. Yeah, that's why you're in prison. You're not good at robbing. These people are professionals. This is what they've been doing since the beginning of time in this country. Yeah. Now, so you went there because you didn't have any money. And all the reasons that, that I, and all those things that were happening in your life, you got mad at somebody, you robbed them, you robbed a dope, another dope boy, you went downtown and snatched somebody's purse, whatever you dumb stuff you did that put you in prison, what have you learned in your years in prison? That would be nothing. You've learned that you shouldn't have made that mistake. And you, when you come out, you might want to get better at it. You have not learned to say to yourself, why didn't I have money to buy food in the first place? None of that. So you get out, and in California, right at this day, if you were to go to prison, and let's say you do a seven-year term, which isn't extremely long like so many of these guys I know done 25, 30, 35 years, you do seven years, and you were a little dope boy over on you know, some corner, and you get out, and your corner is gone. Nobody is even recognize you, and they don't care. So you're not going to be selling any dope. You're not going back to your business and making it better. Where are you going to live? You don't have any money. And your mama or your stepmother, whoever it is that you used to, auntie, grandmother, is like, I don't need you in this house, boy. You ain't got no money and you, and you ain't not got no job. 
You cannot get a job because you're formerly incarcerated. You cannot get a place of your own if you had any money because you're formerly incarcerated. What are you supposed to do? You're going back to what you know. And that's petty right. crime, so-called crime. Of course, I say that crime is a political question, not a moral question. It's legal, but it's a political question. You know, um, you know, if Wells Fargo rips off all these people and uh, houses and everything else, is anybody from Wells Fargo going to prison for that? No. They've stolen millions, millions, millions of dollars, and nobody's going to prison. But Dante and them in the hood, you know, rip off some corner store for twenty, thirty, or forty dollars. They're gonna do four, five, six years, or whatever it is. And if it's your third strike, watch out. You might do, you know, thirty-five years. So, so Keith Carson asked me, "What should we do?" So the analysis is, they need a job on day one when they're coming out. When they hit the ground, they look two hundred dollars. They need to, somebody needs to be standing at the door saying, here's a job, or money, that is. And so I said, why don't you go to all these big corporations that are keeping people who are formerly incarcerated from even having a job and asking them, would they give you a little pilot program? Now, nobody ever did that. In other words, go to Wells Fargo, go to Safeway stores, go to Clorox and all these companies that are based in the Oakland area and ask them would they give you five jobs dedicated to formerly incarcerated, because there's a lot of government money going into re-entry programs that do absolutely nothing. They don't get people jobs, uh, not percentage-wise. So just go to these big corporations so they can open up the door, maybe, to somebody else saying, I'd hire you. Mm-hmm. Well, he didn't do it. Nobody talked about it. So then he called me again and said, well, do you have any other ideas? I said, the only way People are going to survive, survive now. Remember, this is not helping. I'm not a helper. I'm not a charity person at all. Not, I don't even believe in it, okay? I do help a lot of people on a day-to-day, get past a certain moment. But I'm not a big believer in charity, and then we just go home and forget about it. Like, oh, you know, I went to Africa and helped them to get water in the village. You know, who cares? So, um, well, I mean, somebody cares. That's nice for those few people that got water in the village, but, you know, give a man a fishing pole kind of thing. Uh, But more importantly, there's a question of self-determination. I don't have to beg for a job. I don't have to ask the white man, am I offending you by being formally incarcerated? Are my pants sagging because you don't like sagging pants? Do you want to deal with a a suited up Negro? You want to deal with someone who's more acceptable and who speaks your language, somebody like Cory Booker, even though he might be uh, saying some sort of progressive things we don't want these Dantes in our face, working in our in our in our spaces. We don't even want him doing gig jobs, you know, these little delivery jobs. We we don't want him. He's offensive to us. He's offensive. His pants are hanging down. He doesn't even speak good English. He's uneducated. He's a criminal. All of that. So. What are you going to do? The only way you're going to do anything is they got to have their own money. And the only way you're going to have it is to have their own business. And that goes to a question of seeing themselves as not just being um, someone who works for or who has to beg for life, but who is in control of some portion of his or her life. He said, could you do it? I said, yeah. I had no idea uh, at all about how I could do it. And so I just drove around West Oakland, which is a part of Uh, Keith Carson's district, that was the uh, supervisor who asked me this. Um, And I looked for a lot or some empty space where I figured I could put, with his help, of course, I mean, I don't have county money. They do. The county of Alameda County has a uh, almost three billion annual budget. That's a lot of money uh, for a budget for what they do. Um, And not to count reserves of, of a couple more billion. And so, um, and are in the black. They don't owe anybody. So, um, so I'm figuring we're going to talk about how you can fund this thing once I figure out what this thing is. And so I eventually rolled around West Oakland because that's where black people used to be in predominance, where now when, when I lived in Oakland, black people were 49 to 50% of Oakland were now 22% when I lived here in the Black Panther Party, that is. And, um, and now we're 22%. And in West Oakland, we were like 70%. And we're like 22% in West Oakland uh, through, you know, quote unquote, gentrification. So I drove around to look for vacant lots to say, maybe I could create a little kind of like a little mall here and put up all these businesses 
And uh, there would be a lesson in self-determination. Like you don't have to beg, you can own your own stuff. Uh, so that's why I did it. And so I was able to acquire through cajoling, through uh, a whole bunch of stuff, using my voice as a former leader of the Black Panther Party, being really mean and ugly to all the people in the city government who are who deserve to have people be mean and ugly with them because they have done nothing. There is no policy in this city, not one, to provide any type of affordable housing. In fact, the, uh, the, you know, in most cities, there's a general plan and then you have a specific plan where people look into where, where to want to be in 20 years, and all these other things. And in the West Oakland specific plan was passed in 2012, um, led by a black woman elected official. Um, the one sentence in it or the one section in it that was the most egregious was that no new housing developer would be obligated to build any affordable housing. Now, that was actually written in. So in case you thought there was an affordable housing program, there isn't. There isn't. So the property that I was able to get the city to say that it would convey to me if I could develop it um, was like that. It had been blighted and vacant. It was on a corner of a main thoroughfare but led into a neighborhood on one side on the smaller street. And it was uh, three quarters of an acre. And I just kept going around saying, give it to me. Are you, you're not doing anything with it. The law should allow you to do it because you have vacant property, anything from surplus land to, um, and you know, I had to educate myself on all these little details. But the bottom line was I was able to get the city to convey the property to my organization under certain conditions. And one of the biggest conditions <laughs> was that I had to build housing. I thought, no problem, until I understood uh, what a big problem it was and how hard it was and how there's really nobody black doing any building because people can't get, uh, there's no contractors, no black contractors here. There's no black developers here. And all the affordable housing developers are, are white organizations. Uh, and then there's getting the money. But in any case, I've turned the corner. It's a $62 million project. We've had all the stuff done that we need to have done. We're what is called entitled um, and so now we're just fi fin finishing up architectural drawings, going back to get our planning permits. Um, I got a contractor. I have a black architect. Can't find a black contractor, but we have a uh, an Iranian guy. Um, and um, we're going to build 79 units of housing. Now that may not seem is not much to me. It's nothing really. But each unit in the in the in the Bay Area right now, do you know what the what the cost is to build one unit of housing at this point? New housing, whether it's affordable no. or not, doesn't matter, huh? I do not. Uh, well, I can tell you that in Boston it's around two two hundred thousand a unit, or mm -hmm. Chicago, and in Oakland and in Bay Area right now we're at seven hundred fifty thousand a unit. So in, order, in order for me to build seventy nine units, I'm in sixty two million dollars budget. Um, most of which, which is going into construction. Um, but we do have services and all that little, we have all the whistles and bells. And we also have the bottom floor. We'll have a restaurant. We'll have a neighborhood market. We'll have a, a fitness a, a center. And uh, we have a garden there now. It's been there since I was able to get, uh, get control over that property. We've had a garden operated there called West Oakland, um, West Oakland, um, not garden, West Oakland Farms. And uh, we sell our little product. All of the workers there are formerly incarcerated, pay, being paid $20 an hour. I've had to hustle like somebody crazy to get this money together. Still do. But believe it or not, I've been able to do it. I was taken to the grand jury one time about how did I do this? Uh, you know, it's like, go ahead. Now, you don't think I'm going to go down on bad books, do you? So, you know, it's a nonprofit, for God's sake. I, I've never been paid one penny from it. And never would I. Um, and so what our goal is, is that we create these basic businesses to create a model and to show that we can create housing. None of my housing will be, all of it is, when I say 100% affordable, there are levels of affordability that are like a joke. Um, right now in the city of Oakland, um, uh, the what is called area median income is uh, 99000 an individual. So um, you can charge rent based on 30% of income um, and call that affordable today. <laughs> So um, it's kind of goofy, right? But I don't have anything over 60%, and all, most of my units will be under 30% uh, affordability, um, mm -hmm. which means you ain't making no money. <laughs> so, um, But I have subsidies from the HUD 
subsidy pot despite the existence of Ben Carson. And I have worked like a, a dog to put this in place to create a model that I think I can replicate in other cities and show people how they can go through a lot of this exercise. But this is nothing. It's just a, a program of survival. Um, mm -hmm. And that's all I could do under the circumstances. But in addition, I have formed a, a, a political group, we could say, um, that we want to deal with things that are outside of my nonprofit universe, so that things that I cannot do as a uh, with a nonprofit uh, that address questions of police, policing and uh, and all the other ills that we uh, that we see. And so we're having a little food giveaway uh, this weekend, and we had one just to begin because under the coronavirus thing, we haven't been able to really build ourselves the way we'd like to, but we will. And uh, the we operate uh, what I like to say. <clears throat> we've resurrected the spirit of the Panther. And that's, that's what I'm also doing right now. <clears throat> well, bless you for that. That is amazing. It, uh, it's so practical. It's so tangible. And in, I'm sure it helps break that spiral that you talked about. When people come out of prison, they got no platform on which to invigorate themselves when they're in prison. They're not afforded much support in learning and evolving themselves. And then with with the housing, I uh, it's just it's very inspiring. And I want to uh, include on our website related to this uh, the destinations where people who listen to our conversation. I appreciate can't, that. Can't yeah. start there. Open in but, the world, and and you know, and uh, I've got another housing uh, project that I'm affiliated with, that is to say, Oakland and the World, um, uh, called Mark Twain Senior Homes. And this is 102 units of senior housing that need, that we're going to rehabilitate. Um, and people are living there. When I went there and I saw they were all my age, but for I could be there. As a matter of fact, it was only a matter of this or that, that I would have been there. Well, not I wouldn't have been because I couldn't have taken it. But And a lot of these people are living in, you know, spaces that are under 300 square feet um, and don't have a bathroom. And so uh, we had to do a lot of fighting, but um, my uh, co-developer, uh, Ali Kashani, and I um, have figured out a way to um, get these units rehabbed, uh, to buy this building and get it rehabbed uh, so that people can have a decent housing. Um, in other words, why are we figuring out how to change government policy for the next 20 some years? Somebody got to live somewhere. I don't have the answer. I'm just saying this is all I can do within the framework and the limitations. We don't have a big movement acting on anything. Um, what we have is a bunch of uh, people uh, um, who, uh, and I'm not speaking of the people marching in the street, but what they have yet to see is how they're government will react to all of this. I don't care how many knees the Kamala Harris Congressional Black Caucus, Karen Bass, and all these Negroes took a knee. Yes, they had the nerve enough to put Kente cloth around them, symbolizing their Africanness, I guess. Uh, and uh, talking about they're going to have a some kind of police reform bill and have the nerve enough to promote one of the aspects as though that were significant to outlaw the chokehold. Now, can you imagine that in 2020, the chokehold hasn't been outlawed? Yeah. <laughs> and here yeah. these Negroes from the Congressional Black Caucus think that they are coming up with a plan that will pacify everybody and get everybody back in line. Now, this is how Johnson did with the poverty program. Watts was torn up. Um, Detroit was torn up. When King was killed, every city in America was torn up. The rage was there. Nobody knew what to do. Johnson said, I know what to do. Got the little Kerner report to say America was two countries, black and white, one a separate and unequal. And that one line triggered what? The poverty program. And what did the poverty program do? Well, it broke out. It made, it turned people into what we, began to call poverty pimps. Everybody who could figure out how to write two words was applying for some poverty program money to put up absolutely nothing. And the big thing was, I have an arts program that's Afrocentric, or I have a liquor store. Now, if you had a liquor store, you could get an SBA loan 
if you look like you want to be black in the state of California, especially. I know because I was around at the time. They were giving out money to keep the jungle quiet. Here's your money. Now, please let me wage my war in Vietnam and stay out of our business. Let me just let me go on. 68, you know, um, the war is going on in 65. I've given you Negroes the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act in 65. I'm invading the Gulf of Tonkin. Now I want you to stay out of my way. Now here is some money. And everybody shut up, except for some of us. And including and, Mar- and, and Martin Luther King. Well, I just, if you would allow me, I would have said that. I said, except yeah. for some uh-huh. of us, especially Dr. King, which yeah. is why he was killed as far as Elaine is concerned. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because he continued and focused more on the core issue, which was money. And yep. so, but that money was given out. And so what you're going to have now is a proliferation of these ridiculous police reform things. They're all going to do have little details like, oh, well, the police can't use the chokehold, uh, like the body camera thing. We've got the body camera. Ain't nothing. Who, who was, I understand, some guy, I think I heard a statistic the other day, I'd like to see it, where out of all the people that have been, all the police that have ever been charged with anything, like maybe only 10 have ever been actually charged and only two convicted, seriously, in like the entire United States. Mm-hmm. So um, you can march all you want to, and I like it, you know, I don't mind, but let's get it straight. When it comes down to the nuts and bolts, and we get with it, the, like they booed the mayor of Minneapolis. Well, that's fine with me. I don't care. But they had the city council was so terrified. They got up there and said, we are disbanding the police department. And everybody cheered. Now, realistically speaking, we know that's not going to happen, don't we? Now, do we know they're not going to suddenly say, okay, we no longer have a police department. So we're going to have to spend the next year or two talking about what we mean by disbanding. And what we really mean is we're going to redirect some of the funds of the police to other programs. Now, I've already talked to people that got little nonprofits that can't wait for that money so they can do nothing. You know what I'm saying? In other words, yeah. oh, I've got a program of uh, violence prevention because, you know, black people are violent. And so that's a program everyone loves because black people are so violent. We need a violence prevention. That's the real problem. It's the violence in the, in the hood, like Michelle Obama always talks about. The Chicago bringing up one example of one little girl was hit, hit, hit by gunfire. And as your man, the, the blues singer said, shit, we've been getting terrorized. Right. And she's going to act like the little, these people in the Chicago, some Chicago gang, they're the terrorists. So it goes on and on and on. But the point is, that is what's going to happen. You will have a million of these people. And then standing in front of all of the white people will be the black people. Just in case you thought the white people were the problem, I'm going to be kneeling with some white people. I'm going to be out. Had Nancy Pelosi on her knees yesterday. I just fell out laughing. This this is a woman who here in the Bay Area is a, has attempted through a variety of corrupt machinations to develop a place called the Hunter's Point Shipyard, which is a Superfund site overwhelmed by toxicity from nuclear of uh, experiments and from having been the launching pad for, here comes the drum roll, a bomb called Little Boy, which took out what? A couple hundred thousand people in Hiroshima. Now, yeah. that's Hunter's point. Nancy Pelosi and her relative by marriage, Gavin Newsom, when he was mayor of, of San Francisco, they put together a plan with a company called Lennar Development to develop all 400 and some acres of the, uh, Hunters Point Shipyard. Only problem was it's a super fund site. And the other problem was the city had no control over it. Now, when did the city start engaging in developing? It doesn't. It's a government. So, but the real deal was that Nancy's nephew, uh, Pelosi, Lawrence Pelosi, was the vice president of development of this company called Lennar. And they figured out how to get the government, the Navy, to give the land to the city for development, and then the city made a deal with Lennar, and then all the city had to do was to get the Navy to clean up the Superfund site, as if it could be cleaned up like that. All around are 40,000 Black people dying of every kind of cancer you can think of mm-hmm. from being living practically in 
the Superfund site. And once you start digging up that kind of dirt, you are going to have that stuff in the air. You're talking about plutonium. That's not going to die for the next couple thousand years. Now, I'm saying that to say all of this dirty work that has been done by some of these people that we think are polite and nice and wear nice clothes and speak in dulcet tones, I'm just using the Bay Area. I can't speak to a lot of these other because this one I know intimately. Um, and had the nerve not to be on her knee with a goddamn piece of kente, kente cloth around her neck, along with Kamala Harris, whom we reached out to, we begged when she was the attorney general, and before that when she was the, the uh, DA, to prosecute the police who had killed two people. One was Kenny Harding, Harding, who was supposed to have jumped off a bus and not paid the $2 fee, and was chased down and was mowed down with, with, with uh, automatic rifles, and who died... It's on, you can look at the film of Kenny Harding dying a half an hour of death while a crowd stood around him and the police held off the crowd with assault rifles. And you can see him fighting for life and, and, and resisting and, and his body going into convulsions. And he died right there in the streets of San Francisco over a $2 mini a muni bus fare. And then, of course, there was the I thought he had a gun part. Now, you were chasing him for the muni bus fare, but now he has a gun. And at one point saying he had killed himself by firing over his shoulder and missing. Oh. Uh, there was a case of a Mario Woods in San Francisco. None of this would Kam Kamala Harris touch. And Mario Woods was surrounded by about five or six cops up against the wall under the theory he had a knife, which we never really saw. And even if he had one, it was so little we couldn't see it. And he was not moving on anyone. And he was blown away with like 40, 50 rounds on like a shooting gallery. He was up against a wall and they all shot at him. That is also on video taken by another young woman on a bus in San Francisco. Now, this stuff ain't new. That's my point. So yeah. but you have a Kamala Harris who has the unmitigated gall to get down on her knee and put some kente cloth around her not quite black uh, shoulders and then had the nerve enough to challenge uh, Joe Biden about busing, which I just thought was beyond bizarre. But anyway, down on her knees talking about we're going to introduce this legislation. And one of the aspects of it, we will outlaw the chokehold. Really? Really, Kamala? This is what the young people are not connecting up. Right. Their, their incredible innocence and incredible energy is getting ready to be destroyed unless they organize, 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 and get ready for the long haul. Because you are not yeah. taking down 400 years in a minute. And it isn't just the corporations. It's all of these. It's the government that protects and serves the corporations from the president on down to the police. Mm -hmm. That's right. The, it's what you might call the quality of representation is, is dreadful seen through the eyes of a human being. Well, for my part, I spend a lot of time criticizing the blacks because I don't expect the whites to do any more than what they have been doing. Listen, they founded this country. This is their country. This is not my country. This is their country. This was an English country. Um, that, that is to say, the formation was English. Uh, it's English-speaking. Um uh, it uh, it has all of these aspects, and it has been uh, white whiteness and the supremacy of whiteness. Even Lincoln said, "I like any man believe in the supremacy of the white of the white man." I mean, Lincoln has said that. You can look that up. And so, wow. the question is, I'm not expecting anything different from some people. Now that there's a whole group of people like brown people, you know, red people yellow people and black people that I can be talking to and poor white people because in the Black Panther Party, by the way, we formed an, we formed an organization and made a coalition with it called the Young Patriots who were all some hardcore white guys and girls from the South that would have said nigger in a minute, but that recognized that we stood on common ground because they were as poor as we were. So, But they didn't have that history. So this is their country. I don't expect anything different. That doesn't mean I'm not going to move on it. It just means I don't have any expectations about white people in office. I don't see any Hillary Clinton being the friend of black people. 
when she spent so much time walking around talking about black super predators, not counting all the other things that I could uh, talk about, but I don't want to make talk about Hillary Clinton per se. So now I spend my recent years trying to point out the failure of these black people that we fought with blood. As I like to say, Fannie Lou Hamer lost her eye so we could vote in black people that would serve or at least recognize that we had interest in this social construct, no matter how pathetic it is. And what we have is black people, you know, Hakeem Jeffries, Kamala Harris at the top of the list. Then you got your little local Negroes. Here you got a black woman mayor of Chicago. I don't know what she's supposed to be doing. Um, you had a black woman who was the head of the New York City Housing Authority, the biggest in the nation, who was so corrupt. There was so much going wrong in there. There were so many uh, unrepaired houses. People were begging. And when she was finally, uh, finally exposed to have done nothing for all these black and Puerto Rican and brown people living in these things, she was she left the housing authority and sneaked away and nobody knew, knew what happened to her. But guess what? She ended up in Oakland as the head, the recently appointed head of the housing department. Now, how are we going to deal with that? So they put a black woman there so we'll be, we'll be afraid to challenge a black woman. You got a black woman named London Breed who is the, pre, the mayor of San Francisco. And you get a guy like Mark uh, Benioff who says, look, I'm going to address the question of homelessness by saying that a tax should be placed on people like me who make who have billion dollars com billion dollar companies that are located and 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 have headquarters in San Francisco tech companies, tech companies specifically, and you tax these companies and that tax money goes specifically to housing. Now here's an example of how you can take some money and put it into housing. Do you think London Breed supported that? Not only did she support, support, not support it, she opposed it. Now, can yes. you actually believe that I'm saying in this modern time, the black female mayor of San Francisco opposed taking money from rich white men who were offering the money to put up housing for the homeless. Now, that's the kind of reason I can't talk about what Mark Benioff's money is, billionaire that he might be, I can't talk about the Fortune 500 when I've got a black woman standing in the way ready to take a bullet for him and who would actually oppose a little minor reform measure that may have housed some poor black people. Yeah, so I'm on yeah. them and I can do that and you can't, but I can. Right, and I right. do. And I don't play with them. And they all know yeah. it. And so that's how in this city... I was able to get that land because I had to call out the head of the housing department, also at that time a black woman. I had to deal with the black women that were on the city council, which ended up in a very ugly moment in my life, which is not worthy of discussion here. Uh, but if you wanted to ask me offline, I'd be happy to tell you. I had sure. to, to confront the blacks in Oakland to get something done in a place where they don't even have a housing policy. And nobody's enraged by this. They're like, how can we get it done? And how can we do this? And what should we do? What's the answer? The answer is those people sitting right there, they're not, they're not white. They're black. They are so busy, happy, happy to be in Massa's house that they'll do anything to stay there, even if they don't even get paid. Because <laughs> most of them don't have any money. That's the killer. They're walking around poor. I've got the biggest project uh, that anybody black here has got, and, 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 and I don't make any money from it, but there's two other blacks who are calling themselves developers, and neither one of them is developing affordable housing. Hmm. Now, let's just think about that for a minute. One of them is developing a big property and gotten some money from somewhere, some strange government program, and it's all market housing, and he's relating himself to a, an affordable housing developer, which is an Asian affordable housing developer. They are building the affordable housing. He's building the market housing. Let's think about that. California is so hard to live in right now 
I can't begin to tell you. Of course, New York too, and so forth. But yeah. I'm saying, but it's so expensive. San Francisco has actually surpassed New York in cost of mm-hmm. living. Yep. Yep. Where we have a black mayor, so I am uh, criticizing uh, these blacks for having been so opportunistic uh, and so um, willing to betray black people that they will do and say anything uh, to stay in line with the existing scheme. So those are some of the aspects that go to where do we go from here in terms of these uh, these uh, these uh, marches and protests. One of the things we have to look at is who we have in office. Yeah. Yep. Elaine, when I first uh, learned of, of you was years ago. I was a very, uh, how I say, attentive student of the work of Horace Tapscott. And I read a book called The Dark Tree by a man named Steve Izoardi. And it claimed that you wrote a song in honor of Horace Tapscott called I Know Who You Are. And the lyric that I excerpted was, I know who you are, I know of your pain. You've seen all your people in shackles and chains, but you know what to do. You will make them be free, just as you made me. I, uh, at the time, I went and got, which I, was, I believe your second album called Elaine Brown at uh, Motown Black Form label put out. And I listened to it. And I, I used to listen to that back and forth with the uh, record, The Giant is Awakened by Horse. And I wondered if that was true. Did you write that song about Horace? And how how do you see him and all the work that he did in Los Angeles? Can can there be a Horace Tapscott who accompanies you in Oakland and lifts people's spirits? Well, let me say this. I wrote that song. I wrote that song. Okay. Uh Horace was uh my friend and uh I was extremely close to him. And he did a lot for me. So I, I talk about that in my book as an individual, that is to say. And uh, Steve Viswarty is a wonderful man. And uh, he wrote with Horace, Horace's uh, biography or autobiography mm-hmm. before Horace died. Um, you know, if Horace wanted to tell Steve Viswarty that I wrote that song for him, or Steve believes that, then um, I'm all right with that. Um it's not quite the truth, but I loved Horace. Horace was a good man. Um, mm-hmm. Before I knew Horace as a musician, per se, I was um, I had joined the Black Panther Party. I talk about this in my book. Uh, and uh, in August, uh, pardon me, in April of 1968. And uh, somewhere in about uh, June or so, I, uh, I was absolutely, I went into an anxiety uh, anxious, an anxiety-filled moment and said, I can't be in the Black Panther Party. I even went to a therapist. Of course, I had my own issues, but, uh, you know, that's neither here nor there in terms of the action, um, in terms of mental issues and, and emotional problems of my own um, that were that were peculiar to me as an individual. But the big thing was I was in the Black Panther Party and I felt that I really wasn't worthy of it. I had all kinds of problems and misgivings. And I went to this clinic in Los Angeles where a black clinic, free, a free black clinic. And um, the therapist there uh, gave me Thorazine and said, you'll feel better. And I did. <laughs> I didn't feel anything after that. Uh, and so I began to take Thorazine every day and sort of drifted away from the Black Panther Party. Um, at that time, we didn't have the kind of requirement and discipline that you have to be there every day, all day. Your whole life is the party, which, you know, evolved uh, not much long later, though. And so during that period, um, I got a job at something called the What's Happening Coffee House, which was um, a, one of those pacification programs which had been given to uh, some little group. There was nothing but, you know, 
uh, mostly watched gangbangers, and they were just running nothing program. And then after a while, all I was doing was uh, falsifying records. You know, I didn't know the difference anyway because I was. Uh, I don't know if you know what Thurs. Your audience may not know what Thurs. You know, put you out. You know, they give that to mm-hmm. elephants when they want to take them down. You know, it's a pretty strong drug. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I was taking 100 milligrams a day, and I would sleep 90% of the time. So I didn't know what I was doing anyway. So I used to take the bus down to Watts, to the Watts Happening Coffee House, which had been Diamond Jim, a big Diamond Jim's furniture store before the Watts uprising, and they burned that down. And so it was flipped into this so called cultural thing. But there was no cultural stuff going on. But eventually, Otis had to do something. So he had these uh, like Sunday jazz things, and Harvest would be down there. Um, he had something he eventually came to call the Mafundi Institute. I don't know whatever was going on. I didn't know. I was asleep most of the time. I just told you that. So um, I went to the uh, Sunday thing and I sang a few songs or something. And um, But when I was going to work there, I would take a bus and I'd fall asleep on somebody's shoulder and ride to the end of the line. Then I'd ride, take another one and ride to another. And eventually I'd work my way down into Watts. And when Horace found out, he drove me back and forth home because he felt so sorry for me. I was just really pathetic. I was, you can't even believe how pathetic I was. Um, and I was just nodding all the time. And I knew he had the, um, the orchestra and I knew he had this chick Linda singing, uh, but it was all a fog for me until, um, John Huggins came along, uh, who was a, a party, a stalwart and, um, uh, someone I, uh, you know, just, adored, um, who um, helped me to get off the, the uh, Thorazine by simply saying, Elaine, we need you to get back into the game, you know, to get back to the Black Panther Party. And around that same time, uh, uh, three of the black members of the Black Panther Party that I knew from the Southern California chapter that I was a part of were killed on the street there in uh, Los Angeles, at, as we like to say, at Adams and Montclair. Everybody remembered that from that time. And, um, and so, um, that was that, um, I just, um, you know, just kind of stopped taking Thorazine, weaned off of it by John Huggins and his uh, beautiful spirit. And, uh, back in the full, in the full, you know, full, uh, what I want to say, control of my senses as it were, and, and, and completely committed to the Black Panther Party now. Every day, I lived in that big house that John and Erica had where other, some other people lived. We lived collectively. And in the meantime, David Hilliard had said that he wanted me to make an album of some of these songs that I sang, but that had gone away after John and Bunchy were killed. And then we had talked about that. That was in January of 1969. So by this time, I didn't know. I said, well, I don't know how I can make an album. So I went to Horace and I said, know anybody who can make an album? <laughs> you know, And he said, well, I mean, he had albums, and um, I think he introduced me to a guy named Ed Michelle. I can't remember if I met Ed Michelle through Horace, but anyway, who was with ABC Dunhill, who eventually lost that job from being in any way connected to the Black Panther Party. He lost his house, lost his wife, and moved to Hawaii, but anyway, and Ed Michelle was a good guy, too. It's very sad. And um, But some kind of way, I ended up with a guy named Jack Lewis, I believe was his name, who had a company called Vault Records because of Horace. And then Horace says, well, I can... I can do the orchestrations on this. And I was like, fine. I had no idea. I really didn't. I was just like moving along. We got people dying every, every month in the Black Panther party. And our chapter was, you know, well, John and Bunchy, um, no, that's wrong. I have the wrong order. That was in 68. So everything was Horace was just my friend. 69 when they were killed, that's when I talked to Horace about the album. So I just had the Mm -hmm. wrong order of things. In any case, um, and he took me to the to Vault Records, and then we did what is now called direct to disc recording. Um, and he had the greatest band there, and these guys lifted me up. And Horace just wrote out orchestrations. He was such a genius. He wrote out um, uh, orchestrations, you know, like just listening to what I would be playing and my very simplistic piano playing. And um, he would write out all the parts just like that without he had nothing, just sit there right there and script it out. He was with something called the script house and he was doing um, ghost writing for a lot of Motown arrangements. Um, but that's how he made money. And Horace, you know, was, you know, kind of a purist. 
And so he didn't want to make money. And I was like, you know, you're crazy, Horace. But um, I loved Horace. Uh, and mm-hmm. uh, so um, he was a good man. And um, But he was an artist. Hor- Horace Tapscott was nothing but an artist. Horace did not believe in any type of violent response. He had been in the Korean War, and he had seen enough of war. He was smoking weed all day long. He didn't want to have anything to do with, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, the kinds of activities that the Black Panther Party was engaged in. So he sort of lived outside of that for me. But as an individual, I certainly loved him and I cared about him. And, um, you know, I think we saw, I remember once when I my book came out, as a matter of fact, and I went to Essawan Books. I had a big book reading there in L.A. And that's a, that, like the one of the last Black-owned bookstores. And Horace was there and we just ran to each other screaming and we just had so much fun um so that's my little individual story but i really don't like to talk about personal uh stuff too much because it distracts people to you know going down it, that that path of uh, things but i do tell that story in my book um and i do like steve Iswardi. uh i like the fact that he did a book for horace and um you know that's all i can say about that well, well, that's that's lovely. Thank you. I we've been uh, two hours. talking for quite some time, almost two hours. Yeah, and you have shed light, illuminated, gone forward courageously, gone inward courageously, and I have eleven thousand young people in my Young Scholars Initiative who follow this podcast. And they, uh, they're they looking for an example of how to construct themselves, construct a meaningful life, make a difference, see. And I find this conversation will be a tremendous beacon for them and everyone else who comes across this and, and listens to this. I want to encourage people to look into your work in Oakland. And like I said, we're going to put that on the website and and elevate that. But mostly I want to thank you for your clarity, your intensity, for the inner strength that you've cultivated and shared with us today. Well, thank you, Rob, for having me um, uh, and for engaging in me in a meaningful conversation. And I hope that uh, it does uh, have some... uh, meaning for the people who listen to this podcast. And so I'm going to close out by, this is what I say all the time when we talk to people and want to get a message out. I always remind people of what our biggest slogan was in the Black Panther Party, which is all power to the people. Yes. Well, thank you. And uh, I'm sure before too much time passes, as the world evolves, I'll be reaching out to you again. But this was an outstanding experience in my eyes and uh, and in my heart. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.